Scripture, turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Morning sermon is called Rising Above the Abyss Requires Christian Concentration. And the scripture is the chapter of 2 Timothy, chapter 3. I'll read the word of God. But understand this that in the last days there will be times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth, men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. But they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was that of those two men." You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted." While evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Lord, I pray in this time together around your word, Lord, that you would be honored and glorified by the words of my mouth and by the meditations of our hearts. Lord, may you use your word as that powerful force that shapes and changes our hearts. And Lord, as your word promises, that the Scripture would not go void, would not be sent out for nothing, but would accomplish that which you use it for, which is to grow us, to reprove us, to correct us, and to train us in righteousness for every good work you have planned for us. We ask it all in the name of our Savior. Amen. You'll notice in the beginning of this chapter it says, but understand this, that in the last days there will be perilous times. It's another way of saying difficult times or even dangerous times. And in perilous times, it doesn't matter so much what wicked people are doing, even though that gets our attention the most. What matters more is what the righteous are doing, or rather what the righteous are failing to do by omission. I see in this text, 2 Timothy chapter 3, that despite the perilous times, the dangerous times, Christians have this, by God's grace, actually a supernatural ability to be among the total abyss of darkness, to be among a lot of the the trash and and the brokenness of this world, and by God's grace actually rise above it to live as Christian people. And we do this by following God, by leading simple, honest lives, which are filled to the brim with the love of God. So notice verse 1. Paul says this to Timothy, and through Timothy to the church, and he's warning him, he says, know this, that in the last days there will be perilous times. Another word for difficult, terrible, dangerous times that will come upon the world. Now, regardless of Paul is talking about the last days of the Old Covenant, which would be coming upon them 
within 40 years of the resurrection whenever the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed, or he's talking about the last days of the world as it is before the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, or if he's talking in some way about both, there's application for our lives because whether we live in, in those times of last days or not, we need to be aware of what the Scripture says. All of Scripture is relevant for our life. And notice what Paul talks about. Paul talks here about people who in the last times will make the days dangerous and difficult. He says in verse 2, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, and later he says lovers of pleasure. I want to point out something very clear there. Love is not always a good thing. Love is not always a virtue. Because love, if it's ruthlessly set on self, to the exclusion of other people, and to the exclusion of the will of God, if that love is set on money, if that love is set on pleasures, if that love is self, set on self, even love, something that God has made, something that defines the very character of God, people can twist and make it into something that brings about destruction. And so whenever it talks about perilous times that come, and it's defined by people that are lovers of self, lovers of money, and lovers of pleasure, they, they have taken love, which should be the crowning virtue of all virtue. Paul says, faith, hope, and love, these three are wonderful, but only one remains, and that's love. Yet in the last days, even love will be set and placed on the wrong thing and will lead to all sorts of evil and danger. Love, which is, you know, the Scripture tells us God is love. However, love can quickly become the lowest pit of the lowest hell if it's not set on God and neighbor. Remember what the Scripture says. Even the temple in Jerusalem, the place that was supposed to be the holiest place in all the earth, where God was worshipped, where the songs of God ascended up to Him, Jesus says, because of sin, even the temple became a den of thieves. Think about people. You are made in the image and likeness of God. You're the greatest of God's creations. You have such unique abilities. You have the, a soul made to worship the one true and living God. And yet, what can people turn into through sin? We can turn into destroyers. We can turn into monsters. Think of Judas. Judas went from being a hand-selected apostle to becoming a man whose memory and whose name makes us think only of sin and betrayal. So too, love which is the cardinal virtue. Love is of God. Love is good. Love is what makes everything hold together in unity. But love on its own quickly becomes an idol and quickly becomes a way that people sink themselves into perdition. Here, Paul says there in three ways, there's a certain kind of love that brings the horrors of the last day. Love of self, love of money, and love of pleasure. If you take just those three alone, could you not find that one of those three or a mixture of all of them is probably the cause of every war, every conflict, every divorce, every church split, every addiction, endless drama? You could probably, every one of those, you could tie back to love of self, love of money, and love of pleasure. People love themselves too much, and they love their money like it's a god, and they love pleasure so much that they leave behind their job, their children, their duties, their responsibilities, and they seek pleasure at the pain of other people. To all of these things, the scripture reminds us don't you remember, you're just a man, you're just a person. Don't you realize that your money will not follow you into the grave? Don't you realize that pleasure is such a momentary, fleeting thing? And for what? Five minutes of pleasure, we at times become the full of all fools. Jesus says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? What can you give in exchange for your soul? And so yes, we live in a world that says love, love, love. Love is love. Ridiculous. Love what? Love who? Define it. What do you love? What is love? 
If it's not the kind of love that comes from God and it's of God, it's worthless, it's diabolical, and it has the scent of hell all over it. And so we see here in verses 1 through 5 a kind of people that the devil makes through his schemes, his lies, and even through twisted, misshapen love. This is the kind of influence the devil has if he's not stopped by faith, prayer, and fasting. Remember, Jesus tells us Satan comes only to lie, to kill, and destroy. It's all he does. It's all he's good at. But Jesus comes that you might have life and that you might have abundant life. So verses 1 through 5 is the kind of people which are made who have forsaken God and who are led astray by the lies, the passions, and the pleasures of evil. May God have mercy on us all. This is what the Scripture says about the dynamics of human depravity. It's miserable, unable to forgive. Scripture says they don't even love their own parents. Notice what it says there. Verse 2, For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving God, treacherous and reckless, and it goes on and on. What is Paul trying to paint a picture of? He's saying this is what life is like. This is what people are like who do not bow the knee to the Lord, who do not have the love of Christ within their heart. They can't forgive. They don't know what it means to forgive. If you can't love your own parents, how are you going to love anybody? If you don't love your father, how are you going to love God the Father? If you don't respect mother and father, you'll never respect God. You'll never respect anyone. But this is what the devil wants to do. He wants to separate children from parents. He wants to separate husbands from wives. He wants to put within your hearts love of hatred rather than love of good. He wants you to become a slave of touch and taste, to seek immediate gratification, to be so in love with yourself that you never notice your own sin, but you become an expert in the sin of other people, thereby accusing them every chance you get. Like Esau, they will betray and turn their backs on people for a bowl of soup. They will take God's name in vain without remorse, and their sin will become the very dregs of society, covered in shame, rebellion, and hatred, and in the very next way, very next breath, find ten different ways to praise themselves, prop themselves up, excuse their actions, brag about their deeds. This is a man, this is a woman without God's grace. This is a man influenced by Satan, carried away by his lust, spiritually in the grave, but thinking foolishly he has everything together and he's perfectly fine. That he is spiritually blind and he is physically fading away. Karl Marx, a uh, wicked man, said this. He wanted to descend to the very lowest part of hell and from there draw everybody there with him. It was actually an inversion of what Jesus said. Jesus said, I will be lifted up and I will draw all men to myself. Karl Marx said, I want to descend to the very lowest pit of hell and from there draw all men to myself. This is the kind of people I believe 2 Timothy chapter 3 is talking about. And Paul gives a couple specific examples. He says, just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses. Now, this is the only place in Scripture that we get those two names, Janus and Jambres. But we do find their, their names outside of the Bible in different uh, history books and different records. And most people would say these are magicians that lived in the court of Pharaoh. The magicians that Moses and Aaron opposed in Exodus chapter 7 when, when God sent Moses to Pharaoh to demand the freedom of his people and they had this showdown the, the power of God versus the magic of Egypt and there was the staffs turned into snakes and Moses ate the snakes of the magicians of Pharaoh. And so Janus and Jambres are traditionally understood that these were the names of the magicians, of the chief magicians and priests that opposed Moses and Aaron that day. Now there's other history, and again, not, not specified in the 66 books of the Bible that say that Janus and Jambres actually left uh, Egypt with Moses and the Israelites, and they were the ones kind of um, aiding and helping the Israelites build the golden calf. 
and they became the two servants of Balaam, who is the one paid to curse Israel. And so whenever it talks about the evil and the, the false religion of Janus and Jambres, he's talking about the Egypt of uh, the, the, the evil of Egypt that opposed the Lord, Moses, and Aaron. Now, I do want to point out something in, in the way of encouragement. Notice what Scripture says. Despite seeing the, the, the dark picture painted in verses 1 through 5, and how that um, though Janus and Jambres are long gone, that their, their type of spirit and their type of opposition remains to this day, look what it says in verse 9. But they will not get very far, for their foolishness will be, be, will be plain to all, as it was in the days of those two men. And so notice, despite the fact that there is evil in this world, and there's a dark cloud hanging above even where God is working, the foolishness, the folly of people like Janus and Jambres, will actually be made plain to all, and it says they will not get very far. And so the Scripture tells us to avoid such people and to study the Scripture that we might know how we ought to live righteously in the opportunities and the days that God gives us and not to fret, not to worry, but real, really realize that those that oppose the kingdom of God and those that oppose the truth of the Lord, they won't get very far. Jesus has said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I believe in many ways we are witnesses to these scriptures as we see these type of things before our eyes every day. These type of things we see where, wherever Christ is not preached, wherever the church has been silent rather than ready to teach and to preach, wherever the truth has been twisted into a lie, wherever Christians have been careless, wherever parents have not disciplined, wherever... Sunday school classes have been watered down, wherever pastors have been compromised, wherever fathers have been absent, wherever drugs have been abused, wherever life has been despaired of, wherever self is worshipped and exalted, and wherever sin is rewarded and righteousness is criminalized, wherever accountability is non-existent, wherever atheism is taught in schools and universities, wherever we have strayed from reason and from truth, where money, which is man's favorite God, has been worshipped rather than used at, for good as a toll, in all of these situations, and we could multiply them, we see these things gathered together in a wicked intersection. And so study these verses and actually learn what not to do, what not to pe be like. And before we do that, look at verse 5. Among all of the very obvious sins of you know, slander, being unholy, arrogant, lovers of money, Verse 5 is, is a sneaky sin. It says, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. So notice, one of the sins that Paul points out here of, of the darkness of the last days, he says there will be some who have the appearance of godliness, but they deny the power of it. They want to look good, but not be good. Matthew Henry says this, people want to keep religion, but they do not want to have an authentic gospel which demands they surrender their sins and make a full commitment to true godliness. Now that, that was actually Lawrence Richards, not Matthew Henry. But notice, just like today, 2,000 years ago, was the same thing. People want religion. They want to look good. They want to have that reputation of I'm an upright citizen. I do the right thing. And yet, if you deny the power of God, if you deny that that, that power of God can truly change your life and give you a new heart and a new mind to serve Him, not in hypocrisy, but in truth, you actually end up on that list of lovers of self, lovers of money, unholy, slanderous, and those that are disobedient to their parents. People of that group, so sad, rather than just go and be evil and corrupted in a dark corner, it says that they actually go into the church to trick people and lead other people astray. I can't tell you how many stories I hear of people that were hurt or abused in a church. And it's because wicked people love company and they want to ruin good things. And the scripture says, avoid them. Cast the evil one out rather than people become victims. What does it say? 
for among these people. They creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins, and they lead them astray by various passions, always learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Don't be like that. Make a conclusion. Make a commitment. Study the Bible and then say, this is what I believe. Rather than always learning, always wanting to talk about something new, the Bible says, come to a solid knowledge of the truth. Stand for something. Or you'll be blown away and blown about left and right all of your life. Rather, have a backbone. Have a spiritual sense of truth. Read the scriptures, believe God, make a commitment, and draw your line in the sand saying, I am a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't be like those here that are always learning but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. What happens is they lead people astray. They find people who are not solid, not strong, and they say, that's my victim. And they lead them astray into falsehood, lies, and danger. So taking note of, these, of this depravity that is mentioned here, if we were to flip it and say the opposite, you, here's what you'll find, what, you should, what I and you should be like. We should love others, not worship money, but be humble. Honor God's holy name. Obey your parents. Just as the fifth commandment says, honor your father and mother. Be thankful. Forgive abundantly. Forgive copiously. Keep no record of wrong. Speak well of one another. Scripture says in Proverbs, let another person praise you and not your own mouth. Control yourself. Be merciful. Love everything that is good. Be faithful to one another. Don't cheat. Keep the seventh commandment in all purity. Love your spouse and love them only as your spouse. Be easy to speak to. Be easy to reason with. Be teachable. Be patient. Seek after not immediate gratification, but eternal satisfaction. Love God greatly. Love God supremely. And be sure of this, that your religion is not phony, that your religion is not fake, but rather you have a, a faith that is living and active and real by enjoying the very power of God in your heart. In so many words, this is the type of Christian life that we see in verses 10 through 17. I have to bring the sermon to the close this morning. But Paul encourages Timothy to copy his example, to continue in faith, to despite whatever's going on in the world, whatever abyss is going on out there, be holy, be different. Don't use the evil of this world as an excuse for you or I to drift, for you or I to get away with a couple things. Rather, shine as lights in the midst of darkness. And thereby, rise above the clamor, rise above the lies, rise above the spiritual attacks, the schemes of the devil, the, the, the insanity of the world, and live free. Live boldly. Live for Jesus Christ. I'll end as I began. In perilous times, it, it doesn't really matter so much what the wicked are doing. They're going to be busy doing whatever they do. What does matter is what you're doing as a child of God. And maybe what matters more is what you're failing to do. Because every time we don't take responsibility as a child of God, that responsibility often gets taken by somebody else and then used against us. Christians do have a supernatural ability as Holy Spirit-filled people to live among this world and somehow rise above it. To lead simple, honest lives which are filled with the love of God. Remember verse 9, the progress of the wicked will be short and will be shut down. Yes, they will go from bad to worse. They will deceive and be deceived. But the mission of the Christian always remains the same unchanged. Live for the glory of God. Endure suffering as a good soldier and enjoy the blessings of God prepared for you. Even as Psalm 23 says, the Lord prepares a table for me in the midst of my enemies. Imagine that picture. You're in a house, you're at the dinner table, and the enemies are rushing in to get into your windows, to get into your door. And Psalm 23 says, the Lord prepares a table for me in the midst of my enemies. Despite the wickedness around you, remember the scripture, from childhood, God has been preparing you for such a time as this. That's what Paul says to Timothy. He says, Timothy, I know you from your childhood, you learn the sacred scriptures, you learn the holy writings. Know them, for they are the very breath of God, 
to instruct you for all things, to make you perfect, trained in righteousness for every good work. When you were a toddler, learning Bible stories, thinking about fun and games, God was actually preparing a little soldier of the, for battle. When you were learning Bible songs at VBS, God was preparing you for war. When you were brought to church, crawling on the floor, as we have children here today, God was raising you up, even from that time, for every battle, for every challenge, for every child, uh, for every tr uh, trial ahead. God was using those things for your good. God has given you everything you need to fight against the devil, to not believe the lies of, of Satan, but rather to rise above this and live as a son or a daughter of God in this current age. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 18 says this, The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely into His heavenly kingdom. To Him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord, we thank You again for this time together. May we love as You have taught us to love, not as this world does, but rather in the name and in the power of Jesus Christ. Lord, help us never to use the world that we live in as an excuse to sit back, to be passive, to be lazy. But Lord, let us see that there are dragons to slay. There is evil to confront. There is souls that need the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Lord, may it set us on fire of the Holy Spirit to love our neighbors and to show them the truth, to pray. And Lord, to show the world what it is to be a Christian, even in the midst of darkness. Lord, we ask you to answer these things for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We'll sing together the surrender.